I don't know about you, but I'm grateful to God to have this privilege uh, to speak this morning. And I do count it a privilege. Uh, we do not earn the right to preach, but it's by the grace of God that we stand before you uh, this morning. Last week, we had some difficulties that were beyond our control and we were not able to live stream in real time. Um, but we thank God that uh, it's been rectified and we will have a new provider tomorrow. And hopefully their services should be a little more reliable. Now, I need your prayers. Whoever stands behind this sacred desk, we need your prayers. You know, I'm kind of full. Some 30, over 30 years ago, I preached this message. And I wanted to do it one last time. In the process of trying to get this together, that it wasn't a message for an old man, that it was a message for a man much younger than I. So I'm going to need your prayers because I believe the essence of this word this morning is really needed, and particularly to our young people. We are so caught up in this 21st century with external beauty. We body shame, we color shame, we hair shame, we lip shame, we hip shame. And I had to get old to realize that your beauty, whatever it might be, is fleeting away with every stroke of the clock. This message, I hope, will help some young people because old folk have already found it out. Because you put on all the makeup you want. You can have all of the surgeries you want. But Father Time will win in the end. There is a text that I discovered many years ago. And, and you know, when, a, when you read a text and it's not making sense to you, you have to pull back the layers because it has a deeper meaning. This text this morning comes, <clears throat> I don't know why I'm so full. This, this text comes this morning from the book of Hosea. This is a topical message, it's not an expository message where we preach various verses in the text, but we're gonna talk from a topic and the sixth verse, you could read in your private time from the fourth verse all the way down. But I'm just going to read one verse. They will spread out like new branches. They will be as beautiful as an olive tree. They will smell as sweet as the cedar trees in Lebanon. That's enough. A little over 30 some years ago, I preached this message. I was in the prime of life and didn't think about old age that much. And it's been true for almost every generation that we're so caught up 
in physical appearance. In my research date I could find was in 2017. Over 229,000 young people between the ages of 13 and 19 had cosmetic or reconstructive surgeries. What was more appalling was many of them was given this surgery as graduation gifts from their parents. We are so caught up. And, and you know, I, I do look at certain little channels on my phone, and, and I'm just amazed at the young people who think that they are ugly. And they get on there and ask, and they're caught up with this. But Plato, the Greek philosopher, said that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. See, I don't care how beautiful you think you are. You are ugly to somebody. And I don't care how ugly you think you are. You are beautiful to somebody. And don't you let some man, some woman tell you that you are not good enough based upon your physical appearance. You let them know. See, you need to have a healthy regard for who you are. Not being cocky, not, 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 not being self. Uh, but I love me when I look in the mirror. I don't see the same person I saw 40 and 50 years ago. Because I also found out ha, what time gives you. Time will take it back. Time will give you huh, a Coke bottle figure, huh, but keep on living. Time will take it back. Time will give you a soft, smooth, velvet-like skin, huh, but keep on living. Huh, time will take it back. Time will give you a steady stride walk, huh, but keep on living and time will take it back. Time will give you 20-20 vision, but keep on living. Time will take it back. Time will give you a keen, sharp mind, but keep on living. Time will take it back. You young people, when you see all of us old folk, we were young once ourselves. And I've had to tell y'all for over 30 years, I used to be finer than this. But old age ha, got a hold of me. And little by little, I start seeing a new person in the mirror. I don't know if you've ever seen an olive tree. But there is nothing of beauty about it. The tree, first of all, is short. And I could understand the text if it had said, Your beauty <laughs> shall be like that of a giant sequoia, or like a California redwood, or even a mighty oak tree. <laughs> because these trees are tall, grand, and stately. But the olive tree is short, even when it is grown to its full height it grows to about 40 feet that's just about tall enough to be a good apple tree this olive tree not only is short it has a twisted gnarled trunk as though it has been afflicted with a plant form of crippling Arthritis, not a pretty picture. But the scripture says that his beauty yeah. shall be like that 
of the olive tree. Then its leaves are gray green in color. It looks as if it is dusty, it's ashy. And even in a torrential rainstorm, it cannot make it look <laughs> any better. Yet, with its short, gnarled, twisted trunk and its gray green leaves, the scripture says it's beautiful. Hmm. Huh? His beauty shall be like that of the olive tree. Obviously, the beauty of this tree cannot be found on the outside. I, I don't know about you, but I have seen some pretty, pretty people in my life. I'd get an amen on that. Am I the only one that's seen pretty people? Hmm? I mean, when you saw them, you couldn't take your eyes off of them. You watched them walk into the room. You looked at how they sat down because they were downright fine. And when you got to know them, when you got close to them, you found out they were pretty ugly. Something on the inside that when it came forth, it was an attitude, their disposition. That suddenly which looked pretty was actually ugly. And then, on the other hand, somebody say, on the other hand. I have seen people who were ugly. Uh, yeah, ugly. <laughs> By Western standards. <laughs> but yet, when you get close to them, <laughs> there is something emanating from deep within. <laughs> and it, it exp expresses itself uh, in a smile. In a spirit, an attitude, a disposition that suddenly all of that ugliness disappears. And there is a beauty that cannot be denied. Beauty is more than skin deep. My mother said, along with millions of other mothers, Beauty is as beauty does. Beauty is more than skin deep. Well, the olive tree is ugly. So its beauty must lie somewhere else. Are y'all going to walk with me? I want to suggest that its beauty lies in its usefulness and service. Say that. Its beauty, its beauty lies in its usefulness and service. See, the olive tree blooms in June. And the keeper of the olive orchard, he prays for the most gentlest of breezes. Because if the tree loses its blossoms too early, there will be no olives on the olive tree. You see, the olive tree bears a fruit called the olive. First green, then purple. And when it is fully ripe, it is black. And this fruit of this tree cannot be used until it has been put on the olive press. And the truth of the matter is, God cannot really use us until we have been pressed. God has to put us on the olive press and to press us and, and press us. He does not do this to hurt us, but he does it to make you bitter, but to make you better. Anybody listening to me been on the olive press? That, that God had some things that he had to get out of you. 
So the experience of life come to press us. Listen to me, young people. The experiences of life comes to press us. And when you are pressed, we give forth a wonderful oil that can be used in his service. Are you having some hard times right now? Don't worry about it. God is just pressing you. If you're going through a dark midnight and it seems as though the morning will never come, don't worry about it. God is just pressing you and maybe you're having trouble in your, your, your marriage or in your home and you can't seem to work it out and you pray night and day. Don't worry about it. God is simply pressing you so that he might get the best out of you. Excuse me for a moment. I'm going to kind of mix metaphors and I want you to come to me down to Jeremiah and see him in the potter's house. There you see uh, the clay <laughs> and the potter uh, working uh, with the clay uh, and, and the potter takes that virgin clay uh, and he squeezes it uh, and, and, and then uh, suddenly uh, Without warning, he takes the clay and presses it on the table and he picks it up again and he reshapes it and again and, and then he slams it on the table and he presses it. And, and, and I can hear Jeremiah and all of those who stand with me now. Uh, they ask the question, Potter, what? Uh, how are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to get the bubbles out. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got some bubbles in me. And God is trying to get them out. See, if I don't get this clay when it is fired up, will have marred places on it and the only way I can get a perfect vessel is to get the bubbles out. And my brothers and sisters, some of us are on the potter's wheel right now. He's slamming you on the table so that he can get the bubbles out because we've got some bubbles in us. We've got the bubbles of envy. The bubbles of jealousy, the bubbles of hatred, the bubbles of procrastination, not wanting to cooperate, maliciousness. We've got the bubbles in us and God has to put us on the potter's table and slam us and press us to get the bubbles out. And every now and then, God has to press us in order to get the bubbles out because he cannot use us with the bubbles. Now remember his usefulness and service. Now, when the oil comes forth, hear this, it comes forth in two kinds. The, the, the heavy oil stays at the bottom. The light oil, the more premier oil, rises to the top. Now, that light oil that automatically comes to the top is used for one thing and one thing only, to burn in the tabernacle and later in the temple as a symbol of the continuing sacrifice before the Lord. But the other oil was just as important with that heavy oil. They cooked they lighted their homes they anointed their kings priests and prophet and when people were sick they would anoint them with the oil so both oils are important see listen to me all of us cannot be the light oil see some of us must be the heavy oil all of us cannot direct choirs and all of us cannot play the instruments all of us cannot sing like nightingale all of us cannot lead in public worship but all of us have a place and a part to play 
So whatever uh, your job is, whatever your gift is, whatever your talent is, use it to the glory of God. If it's your job to stand there at the door and hand out the program, do it to the glory of God. If it's your job to fry chicken in the kitchen for the church, fry that chicken to the glory of God. Whatever your job is, do it to the glory of God. You're not working for me. You're not working for Monica. What you do is done to the glory of God. Can we say thank you, Lord? Because ultimately, you're going to be used either by the Lord or by Satan. And you know what I say? Lord, use me until you use me up. Anybody in here want to be used? I say, do you want to be used? Well, in the second place, the beauty of the olive tree lies in the fact that it doesn't need much attention. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it don't need much attention. Hmm, some of us can't see no beauty in that at all. See, the olive tree grows in less than ideal conditions. It grows in rocky soil, and there is a small amount of soil on the surface around the tree, and all that is required is that the dresser of the orchard come every now and then to put some water, to water the tree, and to make sure it's nourished. He doesn't have to dig deep, just loosen the soil, and every now and then just give it a little water. Now, I don't know if you see the beauty in that, but there are some people in the church that just can't grow that way. They need lots of attention. They need lots of stroking. They need lots of patting them on the back. And, oh, baby, you know you did such a good job. Oh, baby, I'm so glad you are part of this committee. They just want, and listen, good folk go evil when you leave their name off the program. They don't appreciate me enough to put my name huh, on the program. Huh? That's what they say. They need lots of attention. And some of them never show up until it's upfront time. You've got to always be pulling on them and pushing them up and pulling them up. Begging them, oh, baby, we can't do it without you. You know you make the best greens in the church. Right. But the beauty <laughs> of the olive tree is that it doesn't, it knows why it's growing. It's not growing to please the dresser of the olive orchard. It's growing to the glory of God. You see, the bird that sings does not sing because you like his song. The bird is singing because it's been created by its creator to sing. And he does what he has been created to do. You don't hear me. You have been created to give glory to God by your living, by your walking, by your talking. And if the pastor never says, thank you, serve anyhow. If the auxiliary head never recognized the work that you've done, serve anyhow. Because I've discovered that serving the Lord will pay off after a while payday someday anybody in here know what I'm talking about I don't know about you I want to hear him say servant well done thy good and faithful servant well 
we must remember who it is we are serving. Hmm. Then the third thing huh, about the beauty of the olive tree is its perseverance. Say perseverance. The olive tree thrives in less than ideal condition. Now, life is less than ideal. Things are not the way we want them to be. Some folk don't join churches because they're looking for the perfect church. My advice to you is, don't join it if you find one. Because if you join it, you gonna mess it up. We have less than ideal conditions. Our families are less than ideal. But that's no excuse for you. Our churches are less than ideal. But that's no excuse not to attend to the mission of the church. Your husband is less than ideal. Ladies, be careful about your amens. Your your husband is less than ideal, but that's always not an excuse to divorce him. Your wife is less than ideal. Your children are less than ideal. We are a people of less than ideal conditions. If you don't believe me, just ask George Washington Carver, who all he was given was a peanut. He was a scientist, but with his uh, uh, scientific knowledge, he found the secrets that God had locked into it and created over 300 different uses for the peanut. And with his discovery, he saved the economy of the Southland. You don't know why? Let me tell you, there was a time that cotton was king and we were selling cotton all over the world. But they found out that keep on planting cotton in the same field, cotton was taking minerals out of the soil. And a field that used to produce a whole lot of cotton stopped producing because it didn't have the minerals. But because of a black man, y'all hear me, by the name of George Washington Carver, came up with what they call crop rotation. One year you plant cotton, the next year you plant peanuts. And with his discovery, he saved the economy of this nation. He did it with less than ideal circumstances. And I tell you, you can take less than an ideal situation and make the best out of it. If you can't go to Morehouse, get it at your house. If you can't go to Yale, get it by mail. If you can't get it by mail, sign up online because line is doing fine. I just threw that in. Because when I first preached this, they didn't have education online. Preach pastor. Stop using excuses. Because your situation is less than ideal. And many of you young people are faulting your parents for your failure. Yeah. Hear me today. You grew up in perfect homes. That was dysfunction in every home. But you've got to learn how to rise above the adversities of life. And stop going through life blaming somebody for your failures. And you know what? <laughs> the truth of the matter is the struggle that helps us to survive. Yeah. Huh? Don't you forget that. In fact, say it right now. It's the struggle that helps me to survive. If you see, if you go on a chicken farm and you see a chick trying to emerge from the egg, 
Don't help him out. Because if you do, once the chick has been released from the egg, he will soon die. Why? Because God has built in to that chick a survival mechanism that somehow doing the pecking, somehow doing the kicking, somehow doing the flapping of those underdeveloped wings uh, that God gives that chick uh, the strength to survive. Well, uh, God has given us uh, some hard situation uh, and some of us are always lying around and sitting around and waiting around for somebody to help us. Uh, but the truth of the matter, the help uh, is in you. Uh, Y'all don't hear me. Uh, the help uh, is in you. In fact, is in me. See, when you're struggling, my advice to you is keep on kicking. That's what you tell your children. See, because most of us have given our children too much anyway. I thought I'd get an amen on that. Because we don't want them to be raised the way we were raised. But there was nothing wrong with letting a child know that every time you want something, this is no butler service that we're going to give it to you. Sometimes it's good for them to say, Daddy, I need a new pair of shoes. You got the money to do it, but hold back. Because life ain't like that. You don't get a butler bringing you a pair of shoes every time you ask. But ha, you got to hang on in there. Just keep on kicking those underdeveloped wings. And God will give you the strength to survive. Those of you who graduated from college, you struggled. You didn't know if the Pell Grant was going to get there. You didn't know if the money was going to get there. But the struggle is what helps you to survive and helps you to appreciate what God has done for you. And you can sing like our ancestors. He's brought me from a mighty long way. Well, huh, listen, this sermon is truly for a young man. I'm ready to sit down. <laughs> uh, oh, when I was young, I could really preach this thing, but y'all going to tolerate me just for about another two or three minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, Lordy. The last thing I want to say. In the final place, this tree if you cut it down, it'll grow back. Oh, I like that. You know, I want to shout right now because I know what I'm going to say. <laughs> if you cut it down, it'll grow back. See, you can cut other trees down. That's the end of them. The olive tree will live in excess of a thousand years. And even if you cut it down, it will, y'all say it. Let me do it again. See, I want you to get that in your spirit because there's hardly a person who is here over 40 who hasn't been cut down. Hello. So why don't you say, if you cut it down, I'll grow back. If you cut me down, I'll grow back. I'll grow back. Huh? How about uh, you have, have you ever been cut down? Huh? You don't know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been, y'all can say it, cut down? cut down? Have you ever been, come on, you can do better than that. Have you ever been cut down? Cut down? Have you ever been lied on? Yes. Talked about? Just as sure as you're born. Been called everything. But a child of God. You were. 
Come on, walk with me. Have you ever been sick? Couldn't seem to get any better. You were... Have you ever had hopes? And it seemed like hopes went out the door. You were... Have you ever been retired and you and your spouse were planning on traveling and enjoying life and your spouse got sick and died? You were... Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been standing in the waiting room of a hospital waiting for a grandbaby that you weren't expecting? You thought you would be standing at their high school graduation, but they had other plans. You were... Come on, say it! You were cut down, but you know I've lived long enough to know you really can't cut a child of God down. He gets back up. Am I right about it? Well, let me tell you why. I'm right about it. Over 2,000 years ago, there was an olive tree. He was ugly. The Bible said men would not desire him. They took my child tree and he called himself the tree of life they took my tree nailed him to a tree am I right about it hands and feet he was cut down they pierced him in his side but in put him in Joseph's new tomb they cut him down they cut him down but ha, you really can't cut a child of God down. Ha, three days later, ha, his father ha, raised him from the dead. Ha, hang on in there. Ha, that's what I want to tell you. Ha, have the perseverance ha, of the olive tree. Ha, it's not over ha, until God says it's over. Keep on fighting. Keep on kicking. Keep on flapping. Keep on pecking. And God will give you the strength to survive. Yes, many of you are finding out life is hard. I, I, I was on Facebook and I saw one of our members talked about how rough life was. And I told myself, he's probably in his 40s. <laughs> and he's finding out that life can be tough, but with God on your side. Yeah. And here's the thing I want you to remember. He said, I will never leave you. I don't care how dark your midnight is. God is with you. Yeah. Well, what is my mission? Your mission is to keep the faith. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think about that old preacher. He said, they that wait. You know that waiting is hard. People see you coming. They leaning over whispering. You know they talking about you. Or when you leave the room. Listen, you get to the point. You're like a duck with water rolling down your back. That don't bother you. When you're young, yeah, you young folk care about what other young people say. But when you know you've got the Lord on your side and that he is going to see you through, you wait on him. I said you wait on him. The preacher said they that wait on the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. Sometimes you got to fold your arms. Kind of rock back and forth a little bit. Tears can be streaming down your eyes. And you got to say, Lord, I'm waiting on you. And sometimes God has the delay. He is coming. It's not that he's forsaken you. But God has to teach you some things. And he has to delay. He is coming. But oh, he's coming. <laughs> When they were out there in the middle of the lake, 
They thought that they were going to perish. They looked up and saw Jesus walking on the water to get to them. Why? God was letting us know that I don't care what circumstance you are in. I can come and see about you. They that wait on him shall renew their strength. God is good. I hope you got something out of this little message.